Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to each one of you. I am Larry Kirkpatrick. I'm a pastor. I've been a pastor for about 30 years in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. But today I'm taking off my pastor hat and setting it aside. And I am here as uh, just as a lay person, just as a an interested Seventh-day Adventist person who wants to see the third angel's message prosper, wants to see the church be effective and successful in giving its message and uh, feel that we're all very privileged to have the opportunities we have had to work within the church structure and hoping certainly that that can continue. But welcome to this program. Let me sort of tell you what I'm anticipating and, and hoping for. We're going to have three sections in the call. Uh, the first, we'll try to kind of outline what has happened. That will be hopefully a fairly quick section. Then there will be a middle section where we sort of discuss and analyze what has happened. And then the third section would be what to do about what has happened. This is kind of a brainstorm session, and uh, it, we want to hear especially from people from Mid-America Union. And I think that's Kansas, Nebraska, Iowa, Missouri, Rocky Mountain Conference, uh, uh, Central States Conference, Minnesota Conference, and Dakota Conference. So anyway, welcome to each one, and you're, I'm glad you're all here, but we are going to give a little bit of preference to those people from those conferences if they uh, choose to speak. Paul, would you pray for us as we begin? Uh, I would. Let's bow our heads. Father God in heaven, we thank you so much for this day, another day of life, Lord, uh, another day of your mercy and love towards us. Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit will be with us now, guide our minds, guide our guide our words, our, our thoughts, our, our actions, Lord. Bring us closer to you and your truth. Father, we pray that this uh, meeting will be productive in helping us to know what, what to do and, and where to go from um, with, with the things that are happening within our church. Uh, Father, we just thank you so much for your love, your mercy, and your forgiveness towards us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So, uh, yeah, I guess maybe one last one last piece is that uh, this is not an equal time. It's not a debate between women's or to ordain women or not to ordain women. That's not what this is. If that's what you thought it was, you're dismissed. Uh, but this is hopefully something that will be productive, um, maybe in a different way than that. So um, I have slides for some of the different motions that have been taken, but I think maybe we can just zoom through. Um, in uh, there have been three general conference session decisions, uh, directly or indirectly, saying that the Seventh-day Adventist Church will not ordain women uh, into the gospel ministry. Uh, the most recent one was 2015, and in 2015, the actual uh, motion was, would we allow divisions to sort of make their own decisions? And the World Church voted uh, decisively no, no. Um, nevertheless, uh, since that time, we've had different units in the church actually proceeding independent of the general conference to, to engage in the practice of the ordination of women. Uh, the Mid-America Union, just about one year ago at a constituency meeting, uh, voted that they would basically hear, uh, consider any anything that's sent from any of their conferences. And then just recently, I believe August 21, the Rocky Mountain Conference voted uh, that it would recommend men, men and women, or men or women, uh, for the ordination of the gospel ministry to its Mid America Union Conference. Somebody told me that uh, I believe that the Central States Conference, which is part of the Mid America Union, has already submitted a name and that a woman has already been ordained uh, ordained uh, through the Mid America Union. So I think that's roughly where you are at, except that in the Rocky Mountain Conference case, the constituency itself has voted to, to do that, placing the constituency itself out of harmony with the position of the of the Seventh-day Adventist World Church votes. And so um, somebody can maybe add more, but I think roughly speaking, that's where we're at. Uh, the question is, does Rocky Mountain still constitute a, um, uh, a viable part of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, or has it, in so, so to speak, voted itself by, by voting itself to have a different approach to the general conference session, by voting a different practice, women's ordination, 
uh, has Mid America and Rocky Mountain sort of removed themselves from the uh, from the, the world the world church and is the the space that men, many of you live in is that now a vacant space that needs to be evangelized but maybe i'm getting ahead of the case here uh i'd like to give any space here at this time to uh anybody from rocky mountain or mid-america that would like to speak up and maybe tell us uh, in your perspective what has happened or kind of correct anything i've just said that was erroneous uh, in terms of what has happened with uh between 2015 and now seven years later uh, what has just happened in Rocky Mountain. Is there any updates there uh, before we get into a discussion portion or anybody that wants to comment um, sort of on the, the the beginning space there? Those of you that were delegates at the Rocky Mountain um, constituency meeting, uh, if you could introduce yourself, if you were there and maybe briefly share your personal impressions about what happened and a question, if the majority of the delegates understood that their action was was illegal, so to speak, denominationally illegal, do you think they would have voted it anyway? Thanks. Uh, I was there as a delegate. Um, I know we certainly heard from the uh, microphones at the uh, anti-women's ordination microphone. Uh, certainly, w right off the bat, we heard people talking about this as a um, effectively a uh, rebellion against the world uh, general conference decision decisions um, but we were also told by administration that uh, general conference working, working policy allowed unions to vote who they wanted to uh, select as ordination so there's you know there's a little bit of uh, conflicting information uh, that the delegates were presented with you're saying that the general conference or the uh, the, the you were told by administration that Basically, that the conference has the authority to make this decision. That the unions had the authority to make the decisions of who to ordain. This is the latest strategy, I think. Um, after they didn't get permission to do it on a division level, um, and the E60 um, incident occurred where they tried to do it on a division level and were told, no, you're not a separate part of the general conference. The divisions are part of the general conference. You don't have a constituency. Then they thought, aha, we'll, we'll vote at the constituency level. So I think that's why we're seeing it at the union level and, and also at the uh, conference level. Right. Um, yeah, this reminds me back, and maybe I'll go ahead and try sharing uh, an item here. Is this it? Yeah, this is a letter from Dan. Can you see that? Maybe I can enlarge that. Um, this is a letter from Dan Jackson to the NAD unions and conferences in the year 2012. This is 10 years ago, friends. Um, but he wrote, uh, while we as a division family have philosophically supported women in leadership at three consecutive year in meetings, the time has come for us to become practical in our application of, uh, um, you know, basically, um, philosophy and belief, he says the North American division and its unions and conferences uh, must become more intentional. And uh, so on here, he doesn't say exactly to vote it in, but uh, but it says that, that he wants the unions and conferences to become more intentional. And that certainly is what we've seen down through these uh, through these years. 10 years later, here we are. And uh, I guess the action, the action in uh, August 21 seems kind of intentional to me. Uh, yeah, I've talked to a number of delegates now that told me that they were told that we had a variance that was permitted, that would permit us to do this. And of course, uh, I've, I've checked on that a little bit. A variance has to be submitted by the division to the general conference. Uh, and then they, they have to approve it. That never happened. So somebody may have intended to do that or tried to do that or whatever, but anyway, the story got around. A lot of the delegates actually thought it was a legal action. I suspect that it's possible that if we uh, could find out from the GC exactly what that situation is, that maybe even the vote that was taken could be rendered void because it was an illegal vote which is what we had been saying all along. But so uh, if they had an actual variance from the GC, I suppose that's possible. I know that uh, the NAD back in, this is around 2012, 
they asked the GC, maybe it's 2009, they asked for a variance. The NAD, the division actually asked for a variance and the GC voted in its annual council, no, you do not have a, you, we will not grant you a variance. And then about three weeks or four weeks later, whenever it was the year in meeting of the North American division, they voted themselves a variance. <laughs> so, um, however, they uh, later came back and said they didn't have authority to do that. But what we see today is that it's just being voted willy nilly here and there. So it's kind of, I think where we are. Anybody else that was at the constituency meeting have any any reactions, any thoughts about uh, about what you experienced there, the spirit that was there, the decision that was made, which was certainly an illegal decision because only the the general conference can decide the criteria for ordination. It's true that individual unions uh, are authorized to determine who they'll grant credentials to, who they would grant or ordain minister credential. That is left up to the different unions. But the criteria, you know, uh, that is strictly on a world church basis, and uh, absolutely, the Mid America Union is is totally out of out of line. Rocky Mountain's totally out of line. The North America Division, which is actually the General Conference, it's actually the local part of the General Conference, uh, by not acting with reference to this in an appropriate way, they they, in essence, are uh, in the same space of not not having the authority to do this. Nevertheless, it's being done. Engel Yoder from the Kansas Nebraska conference. We shed a little bit of light uh, on the justification so-called for the Mid-American Union after, um, as you say, Larry, a, a year ago or so, they had a constituency meeting and voted themselves a variance since apparently NAD cannot do that for themselves. Uh, some seem to think that unions can vote themselves a variance from GC policy. So after that Mid-American Union constituency meeting, I contacted our union president, Gary Thurber, and asked him how he justified doing that and that recommendation to the meeting. And he's, since the, our bylaws specifically state that our, all of our policies will be in harmony with GC policy and NAD policy. And so he said he, he had the very same question himself. And he asked the for legal counsel from the GC as to whether or not the Mid-American Union would need to, to amend its constitution and bylaws in order uh, to have this variance granted to themselves. And so he contacted the legal counsel at the GC and was told that he, the Mid-America does not need to change its, amend its constitution and bylaws. And so he said he, he didn't understand it himself. And he asked me if I wanted to, I could contact the legal counsel. The legal counsel is Karnik the Luke Metzian. And I contacted him and he never replied. So I still don't have um, an answer to my question, but the justification for the, of the Mid-American Union to proceed in granting itself a variance is based entirely on the legal counsel from the GC, whether it makes sense or not. You do know that uh, the NAD legal counsel, Karnak, uh, Demetian. He's also the GC legal counsel because the NAD is the GC. The NAD is just the GC in your neighborhood. Um, so anyway, the bylaws and all that are really, I think, what matter, not uh, not one guy's opinion. But yeah, that's the kind of problem, one problem we've had these last seven years is uh, we have these unions and divisions in, in conferences proceeding as though they have authority that they do not have. And unless somebody 
stands up, they're just uh, they're just going to get their way. So, anyways, um, anybody else wanted to comment on uh, on the meeting, or shall we move more into the analysis part? I have Susan from the RNC. Certainly, go straight ahead. Susan. Hello. Susan Alexander, I'm in the Rocky Mountain Conference and um, was a delegate, still am a delegate. Um, the spirit that was manifest by those who were pro women's ordination was, uh, I, I think it, it, it was not interested in whether what they were doing was legal or not. And uh, the, G the GC remedy following the 2015 vote has no teeth in it. Um, and so I think they feel pretty free to go ahead and do what they wish because nothing is going to come of it. I think there's a an attitude of no concern. Also, North American division officers and other employees were present at that meeting. And uh, one even spoke just before they started the discussion about the women's ordination issue, uh, supporting it. And so it's very obvious where the uh, North American division stood. And I think it gave added power to those who were um, wanting to go against the general conference session vote of 2015. Okay. Well, uh, let me go to some more questions and maybe move into the next section of our, uh, well, let me ask you this. And just if, if a Sabbath school teacher in your local church were to begin ordaining clergy in your local church and he were to uh, begin to follow a different practice, let's say he was going to begin um, not only or, you know being in the Sabbath school, but he begins ordaining clergy, Let's say he came in and he said, uh, by the way, we're not going to go by the decisions of the general conference anymore. Now we're going to take that as uh, as opinions. We're not going to take that as as authoritative to us. Uh, and he began to have and he began to receive tithe. I'm just wondering what your Sabbath school class uh, would do about that person. What would your local church do about such a person? And. <laughs> um, I mean, obviously, you can see the comparison. Um, is that valid? I mean, is is the can the conferences do whatever they want, uh, but the members can't? I mean, is it? Am I right to assume that none of your churches, none of your churches, you would allow somebody to start ordaining people at random and following different practices and deciding that what the world church says doesn't matter? Um, Am I right that you would discipline that person or remove that person? Yeah, absolutely. The issue is that you can do anything you want at any level of the church if nobody does anything about it. And so what is breaking down here, it's not just this issue. What's breaking down is there is no line of authority and there is no response from the higher entities to immediately take care of the problem. And so even as I understand it, the disciplinarian uh, dis disciplinary uh, system that we have set up says that the next highest authority is supposed to deal with it within six months. And if it isn't taken, taken care of, then it goes to the next highest level, which means we're a year and a half away from the GC dealing with this particular issue in our conference, if I understood that disciplinary problem correctly. And so here we are at the very low at the very lowest level, wondering how we can fix it when it's really the duty, the responsibility, the reason for their existence is to keep the organization working properly. And that means they should be dealing with it as it happens. I don't even believe that we even had a GC representation at this constituency, which is a first in my experience of attending many, many constituencies over the years. Uh, if there was any GC representation there, I didn't know who it was. So let me ask this, uh, anybody answer, um, is it possible, is it possible that somehow the Rocky Mountain Conference leadership and the Mid-America Conference Le Union leadership and the North American Division leadership 
or even the general conference leadership? Is it possible that that any of them don't realize this is a kind of a pretty super divisive issue? Is it possible that they you've not spoken to them that they don't really know they don't know that the people are unhappy about this and that they maybe they're just oblivious and they they just made a mistake they didn't know that this was an issue? Is that possible? Um, Steve, RMC. I think they're very well aware of what is uh, transpiring and they've just positioned themselves to a point where they don't have to worry about how we, everybody else feels. It's, it, it parallels so much with what's going on in our nation. And that brings us in my mind to a situation that we need that I think needs to be addressed at first. And it's the same thing on the national level. And that's what I would say call safe and responsible elections. I, I was a delegate to the constituency meeting at Rocky Mountain Conference. I received a packet. It had uh, information in it that uh, in my mind was very biased and unbalanced. And uh, I, I feel that whoever sent the packet out should have been a neutral party. And by not having that, it uh, put in the minds, in my opinion, in the minds of many of the delegates, how they should vote. And again, too, uh, going back to um, some of the meetings that we had, I can't remember what they, they called uh, the particular meeting, but we, it was a town hall meeting that was it. And we nominated people. And unfortunately, uh, you had the people that were in uh, charge in the conference uh, running the, uh, the meeting. I, I think that is, is unfortunate right there. In, in our elections in our country, at least to this point in time, we haven't allowed for that. And we have uh, a very important thing is, is an informed uh, elect electorate, uh, people that are informed on the issues, know where people, know where other people stand, and that's missing. I was, I basically, especially when you have new, when there's a change of the guard with, say, new uh, officers that are being uh, put forth by the nominating committee, I as a delegate have no idea what they stand for. Also, I have no ability to interact with other delegates. And that's kind of like the cancel culture that we have in our country right now. And if we don't deal with that, everything else as far as anything corrective is concerned, in my opinion, will be fruitless. And that's pretty much my thought on it. Okay, my wife you. did have a if that's possible for her to talk. She was also at the constituency meeting, although not a delegate. Sure, let's hear from her and then we'll hear from Barbara and then I think Ben has his hand up next. So let's hear from you. Yeah, Hi, ahead. I'm Charlene. I'm Charlene and I was with at the constituency meeting also, but not a delegate like my husband said. My big concern addresses the first question of the day and that is, how do we know what churches to go to? But m my concern is that there will be no churches in the Rocky Mountain Conference because the, the uh, administration made it very clear that they would discipline any Employee. employees who did not agree with, their, with this vote, with their opinion on women's ordination. On women's ordination. So they are completely taking away our freedom and um, taking and, and threatening our pastors who want who don't believe, uh, you know, who don't believe in women's ordination. So that is a real concern to me. And that's I would like to just have other delegates address that or other. I'd, I'd like to see that address, see what we can do to establish more freedom in our church. Thank you, that Charlene. That is a very important because um, that's coercion of uh, employees. But let's go over. To, uh, thank you for sharing. Let's go to Barbara. I was a delegate at the constituency meeting, 
and I spoke out against women's ordination, but sadly, I saw that there were so many people that really had not an opportunity to voice their their opinion because they cut it off after a certain amount of time, which I understand in some situations, but they wasted so much time at the beginning that those who could have spoken weren't able to. But what I wanna know is, isn't there a two third majority vote um, on, on mm -hmm. any of their proceedings? Aren't they supposed to have a two thirds majority? Because 59 to 41 was not two thirds. And secondly, I don't understand, my heart breaks that they, the general conference cannot take immediate action and discipline the church, the, the unions that are not uh, abiding by the vote of the, of the world conference. So uh, two things, um, I'm trying to remember the first one you had. Uh, well, yeah, two thirds. Uh, if it's a constitution and bylaws change, it does require two thirds majority two thirds, uh, but if it's just a motion that's not an actual bylaws change, they can get it with a 50% plus. So in the second piece you asked, why can't the GC come in and do it? Um, I actually have it, in fact, I have it somewhere here. We could actually throw it on the screen if we really needed it, but um, I've just recently reviewed the general conference working policy uh, and it's B95 and right in there, all about how they would deal with something like this. And uh, basically it always requires the next higher organization. And so to, to get anything substantial to happen and also long periods of time. So, so Mid-American Union would have to work on discipline for Rocky Mountain. NAD would have to discipline Mid-America Union. And uh, obviously for the last seven years, we've seen nothing of the sort. So basically the mechanisms that we have, uh, unless you had the GC Executive Committee just stand up and vote to deal with something, because they can do that but they've not had the interest level to do that. So that's kind of an answer to what you're doing there. Uh, normally they don't like to intervene, but at this point, it seems as though we're kind of in the time of the judges, you know, kind of in the time like the early Adventist church in those early years when the Adventist church was forming and finally you get a, a Michigan conference formed in 1861 or thereabouts and the general conference formed in 1863. Uh, that was kind of almost the time of the judges but they brought an uh, organized system out of that. But today, um, we've been seven years since Gen General Conference 2015, and it seems like we really are kind of back in the time of the judges. Uh, nothing's nothing's being done. So um, anyway, um, Ben, you're waiting patiently. Maybe we can hear from you next, and then Paul. Yes. Um, <clears throat> part of the problem is that when the delegates go to a constituency, they don't understand how things work. And I'll give you the best example. The very first things that we dealt with, of course, was electing the administration of the conference. And in every case, and it happened in every single case, there was a request to refer the nomination back to the nominating committee. Uh, here's how it works. When you make that request, the chairman is supposed to grant that request. And if for some reason they don't, then you can appeal it and then the delegates present vote on that appeal. Instead, the person running, uh, chairing the, the meeting at that moment, what they said, is that a motion? The minute you say yes, that's a motion, then the delegates vote. And people went there prepared, and I found this out after the fact, the people were meeting and making arrangements. They went there prepared to stop to, to support one entire agenda. And so when, when the vote was taken, whether to refer uh, the names of the administration back to the nominating committee, in every case that ended up being a motion, it was voted on by the delegates and the delegates voted down, sending it back to the nominating committee. Now, if you were a delegate in your church and you were just talking about your local nominating committee in your church, if somebody wants to send back to the nominating committee, and the whole church and business session stands up and votes not to send it back to the nominating committee. Why would you do that? You don't have any idea what the person is going to say about this person. For all you know, somebody you've elected to be Sabbath superintendent uh, is a drunk and beats his wife. And, and somebody has absolute proof of that. Maybe it's his wife that's going to take it back to the nominating committee. And the whole church says, no, we're not going to we're not going to listen to you. Something is breaking down because 
Uh, well, they give us a booklet and this and that, but how many delegates actually understand how it works? That, that's where we fall down. We are lay people dealing with professionals who are protecting their jobs and advancing their agenda. Okay, yeah, that's kind of the way it works out there. Thank you, Ben. Uh, it's sort of a trick to ask them if it's an, if it's an actual motion uh, instead of just accepting the referral, but that got them where they were going. Paul, you're next. Um, you know, kind of to, to answer your question about whether this seemed very intentional or if people were oblivious, I think there was a little bit of both. Um, I, I can only speak for our church, but from what I hear, this was uh, was was uh, sent to, to other churches from the conference. Our, our pastors, when we were choosing our delegates for the meeting, our pastor was told to ask, you know, to to uh, have new people, you know, involved, people that have never been a part of it. You, you know, this 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 there was this push for. Um, you know, this diversity and, and new people involved. And unfortunately, I think that was a tactic of the conference to try to get people that were maybe less educated on these matters to be involved and vote on things that they maybe don't know much about. Um, so I think we have some intentional stuff from that perspective. And then you have a bunch of people who are maybe oblivious to the matter and are voting based on their feelings and not necessarily on what's been, you know, studied or having any, done any study themselves. So I think we saw a little bit of both intentional actions on some part and just some oblivious on the other part. My name is Go Ben ahead. Van Fossen. I'm with, uh, I was a delegate. I've been a delegate the last two constituency meetings. Um, and uh, to, you know, what Paul was saying, uh, was was rather stunning to to hear our pastor say that uh, Ben Trujillo wrote an excellent article on what we went through as a church and trying to have an evangelism um, series where the speaker was um, the conference didn't like the speaker unanimously voted uh, to forbid him from coming to our church to speak we still held the meeting um, at a neutral site um, but uh, we've been, you know, struggling with uh, a heavy hand of the conference for uh, over a year now, just just to do evangelism. And even the series wasn't on women's ordination; it was on the fundamental beliefs of the Seventh Day Adventist Church. Uh, we had an amazing turnout. But what's interesting is um, the same pastor that demanded that he that he take uh, our request for. Uh, this particular speaker um, to come and speak at our church, which was voted unanimously by our board to have him come. Um, he's not only an excellent uh, teacher, but a, a good friend of many of us. And uh, as a result, uh, we kind of, our church got lumped in. I, and this, this is my opinion. Uh, we got shunned a little bit and um, all of a sudden I was forbidden. Um, to speak at our sister churches and uh, by by the pastor um, this is information that was given to me from elders from from those churches and uh, really the majority of our church was banned from speaking because when you have one pastor that has five churches you need people to step up and and speak and uh, as a result of being banned the conference then took us out of that church district and removed our pastor. So we are uh, pastorless at the moment, and I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Um, but it, this is more than just the uh, just the vote that what has been the seeds that have been planted for so long um, to really create divisiveness and and uh, you've got people that are upset with you that you can't even really talk to about anything. Um, and, you know, the one thing, you know, Larry, that stuck out was the, the climate of the hour that we were given um, to speak for or against women's ordination during the constituency meeting. Um, a lot of people, not everybody, but the majority of the pro side um, were, it was subjective. There wasn't scripture. Um, there was actually, when scripture was brought up 
from the against the ordination of women, um, you could hear murmuring and people mocking and, and getting loud when somebody was uh, presenting scripture or spirit of prophecy. Um, so I, I, I the administrators, the uh, conference president, um, Thurber and uh, English, you know, they made a call for decorum. And that call for decorum was, it just seemed formal in that it was addressed. But as soon as, you know, um, everything was leaning towards the pro side and in and, and their comments, uh, there was clapping, there was, it, it was just a very different climate when somebody spoke um, for and against. And uh, little to no, I didn't hear any scriptural support uh, on the on the pro side um, when when I sat there. I was there ten hours um, for for all of it, and I, I was really fighting self because so many people were disruptive when somebody was speaking against women's ordination. Um, so not just turn around and tell people to be quiet because it was. Uh, it was it was kind of something tough uh, to to experience, and also in our bylaws. And then then I'll be done making a comment. Uh, there was this uh, elimination of the general conference, like those words, general conference, general conference. So this idea of like separating our conference or our union from the general conference from the world church seemed very blatant to me. When we asked them why would you eliminate the word general conference. Um, they couldn't give a, a response. The, the only thing that was said was, well, it's assumed that, you know, the Rocky Mountain Conference, the Mid-America Union uh, is general conference, so we don't need those words. But I thought that was a tactic to further distance from what the world church uh, had voted. That was just what I had experienced there. Yeah. Um, somebody mentioned, by the way, before we began, that maybe that if you guys had an interest in connecting with each other, that if you put your name, your phone number, and your email address in the in the uh, chat window, that later that can be gathered, and uh, that way the people in Rocky Mountain and Mid America, you can have a way of connecting with each other if you wish. So I'm just going to encourage anybody who wishes to do that to put your name, your phone number, your email address there. Well, we also have, I think, in the chat section, a signal group that you can join where you can be connected to each other. We're encouraging you to, while we're continuing with this meeting, uh, to possibly put that in so you guys can be in communication with each other if you are led to. What do you anticipate will happen six months from now, 18 months from now, three years from now? Uh, if no particular action is taken, um, what do you anticipate will happen in Rocky Mountain in Mid-America? Ben, I see your hand. Well, part of our, our real issue in Rocky Mountain Conference, I hope this is not the case in other conferences where this issue will be brought up, but one of our problems is that it's not the administration that is the real problem at this point in our conference. Uh, a conference president or treasurer or whatever, uh, they can come into this conference, um, they can be removed, uh, they might get ill, they might die, they might uh, decide to leave the ministry, they might become used car salesmen. Uh, life happens, and those things, you know, happen. But the problem is that our delegates, the majority of the delegates, we, the, the constituents of this conference, the majority voted to go take an action that is against what the GC in full session voted. And so we have an education challenge. Okay, so let's say we get our way and the conference backs down because they start losing, losing tithe or whatever. It doesn't change the hearts of our members who are represented by these delegates that voted to start ordaining women even though it's been rejected by the GC. So that's the real issue because even if we got what we wanted, we'd still be the minority. They, it's now a voted constituency action. It's a vote voted by the delegates. I mean, that brings it to a whole new level. Uh, you can bet that the the unfaithful leaders who've led your conference into this situation, unfaithful leaders in the Mid America Union and in the Rocky Mountain Conference, they are going to stand with both feet 
absolutely firmly on the voted decision of the constituents in Rocky Mountain and in, in the Mid America Union a year ago. So you can be sure that they're gonna they're gonna hold on really tight. That'll be their foundation. Um, do you think things will change, Ben? You're still there, um, unmuted. Do you think things will change in uh, a year from now, uh, three years from now? Is there any sign that anything would change? Unless hopefully something else would happen. But the way things are going now, it, is there any sign that the administration is suddenly having you know cold feet? They are worried about the the what's what the result is. Are they going to back up? Is there is there any sudden concern, or where do you think you'll be? I think things from... will change, but I don't think we'll be happy with it. In other words, what's going to happen, for example, in my local church, uh, Campion Church, um, we have the academy here. We're kind of an institutional church, but we're a, a community church. Uh, we are probably going to be having a vote sometime early next year on whether to start ordaining women elders. We have not done that for many, many years. We've uh, three times voted on it. Uh, as a church in business session, not to do it. And now it's going to come up again. And already people are saying, we don't even have to vote because if we can have an ordained woman pastor, well, duh, obviously we can have an ordained woman elder. Uh, and so uh, I think that this time it will pass. I think that uh, uh, across the conference, there will be a push uh, to make sure that every church has women elders. In other words, I think they're going to strike while iron is hot. They don't have other jobs to go to. I'm talking about the administration and the conference leaders. This is their job. And if their main focus is this agenda, instead of proclaiming the three angels messages and, and, uh, and working with the organization, if they have an agenda that they're pushing, that is their job and they work at it 24 seven, whereas, um, you know, I spend uh, 12 hours a day taking care of my business and taking care of my home stuff and meeting with family. And we, everybody has all these issues. They've got some of those issues too, but their job every day is to do what, to advance their agenda. In the last part of this call here, we want to bring together any suggestions or any, any possibilities. I actually have a crazy notion I can share with you, but first I wanna hear from any of you. I mean, We've waited kind of for, uh, for the GC to help. I don't think we've been waiting too much for the Mid-America Union to help, but they should have. But here we are. And instead we have, I think there's whole unions, uh, not only Mid-America Union, but Pacific Union, I think is in a grim state and some of our overseas unions. Um, and I think maybe some other places. I mean, it seems like women's ordination is happening all around us in spite of all the, uh, the things the General Conference supposedly could could do or would do. Nothing's happened except that we're getting more and more of this. What could be done? Because the other things seem not to have worked. Uh, I see Brother Clegg, I think you have got your hand up. Go ahead. If we look down the road, um, what is it that we see? regarding the movement that's taking place. And again, I'm gonna draw parallels to what's going on in our country because I see so many. And I feel that there's an attack ultimately on the family unit. Um, this whole argument of women's ordination on the side of the left has been a cultural feeling type uh, approach. And so that weakens that bond that exists there. Um, what's coming next, I think we all know. Um, it opens the door for, since, since the argument for women's ordination has been, well, it's just time now and uh, it just seems right, but no scripture, then it's the, uh, the issue of uh, sexual orientation. And how do we deal with that? So ultimately, one of the aspects that I think that we can approach is to strengthen the family unit. And instead of having women's ministry and so forth, how about family ministry? I think that would be a good start. So yeah, I don't know if you can see this slide here, but there's two kinds of secession. 
There's secession from truth to error, and there's secession from error to truth. There is a time when a group moves from truth to error, and there's sometimes there are times when a, a group moves from error to truth. There are sometimes churches that find the Sabbath, and uh, almost whole congregations sometimes come out and become connected to us as a Sabbath-keeping body. Uh, there's also times in history when uh, there have been a movement from from truth to error. Obviously, the uh, the papacy, uh, the the faithful had to separate from that. You can read about that in Great Controversy 49, 50, 51, 53, those pages. You, basically, you have a case now where Rocky Mountain is ordaining its own clergy. It uh, it has its own view of the world church. You know, basically what the GC Con General Conference says is a suggestion instead of authority. Has its own practice, ordaining women. You have your own local congregations. You receive tithe. And it's arguable that the Rocky Mountain Conference has voted itself kind of out of the Adventist church, so to speak. Of course, it's still connected. It's still the institutions are there. It's still the monies still go up and down through the chain. But um, it is effectively as though somebody in your Sabbath school began teaching something weird. Um, yeah, I'm not going to try to run all these slides here. Um, but I wanted to come to the crazy idea. Where is it? Okay, here it is. Uh, I don't know if this is premature or not, but here's a suggestion. And if you think it's crazy, wait, you know, wait till you look at number number six. But um, I'm just going to throw this out there and you can throw it completely away. But this is just a possible thing you could do in your area. And I'm not calling you for you to do it. I'm just been brainstorming. And this is something that has been talked about. You could start a distinct organization in your area. You could um, declare in your foundation principles that your group will never ordain women. You could uh, declare you're willing to receive financial gifts, hire Bible workers to instruct people, just in exactly the same thing we do before. You're instructing them in, in the 28 fundamental beliefs. You're preparing them according to the lifestyle standards that the church embraces. In other words, nothing at all different from what, what we're doing now. Um, can have some way of keeping people informed what this missionary society is doing, whatever you call it. You could write the GC and request that this missionary society be directly attached to the GC because basically your local conference and your local union have gone effectively, have gone rogue. They are practicing their own, uh, their own ecclesiology, their own viewpoint about the world church authority. They're practicing their own uh, ordaining women. I mean, there's nothing, if they can ordain women apart from GC authority, there's nothing to stop them from ordaining LGBTQ and whatever other letters become interested. Um, and you shouldn't spend a lot of energy criticizing the church. You should just have a group that's focused on, basically what my concern is, is to see the, set, the third angel's message go forward in Rocky Mountain territory. So what's that? San Juan County, New Mexico, Colorado, and Wyoming, and really Mid-America Union. It seems to me that your area has vacated itself by constituency votes uh, from being seen as legitimately having the authority of the Adventist Church since it's rejected the authority of the Adventist Church in general conference session. I mean, it has unambiguously rejected that. So I'm just throwing this out there. I'm not trying to uh, get myself a hot seat meeting in the conference office for saying this, but I, I think that your area may have left a vacancy where we want to bring the third angel's message. And so I'm throwing some ideas here. So that's uh, just throwing that out there. All right, I see hands. Let's go to the first one on my list here, which is Susan. Yes, again, um, Rocky Mountain Conference and uh, a delegate. One of the things that has become very apparent to me over the years and most recently because I was involved with a group that was working with our conference officers on a very serious issue um, in my uh, local church, that there's very little interest in following biblical guidelines. There's very little interest in doing what is best for the progress of the church. The focus largely is on convenience and money. I am in trepidation of the idea 
of dealing with our tithes and our offerings and what we're going to do with that. But I have people coming to me and asking me about this. What do I do? I am do not feel comfortable. I do not feel honorable before God if I send my tithes and my offerings through the regular channels to the conference. And I think we need to look at this issue and try to address it from a biblical point of view. Thank you, Susan. By the way, I have recently become aware that there is a uh, North American division working policy that any money that you might send from, let's say you're a member of the XYZ conference and you, you've done a, you can't feel like you can conscientiously support the storehouse and XYZ conference. So you, you send your money to conference ABC, uh, to the storehouse and their conference. I've recently become aware that there is in the North American division working policy, a requirement that the ABC conference has to turn around and send the money back to the XYZ conference. So, Solving the tithe and offerings question by sending money to a faithful conference maybe doesn't work uh, because they may have to send it straight back. So I'm not sure how that's being followed. Um, but anyway, I just thought I would add that piece. Ben, I think you're next. Go ahead, Ben. I like your suggestions, but I especially like the idea that if we started an organization like this, we could tie it directly to the general conference. That makes a Seventh day Adventist who are still responsible and under the authority of the GC without intervening unfaithful entities in between. And that answers the question that if the, if the conference knew, for example, how many people that I know in my church and in surrounding churches have asked me, what can I do to send my tithe somewhere else? And, and I've already found out what you found out is that it doesn't do any good to send it to another conference because they send it back to your conference anyway. And I, I have even go, uh, gone so far in my thinking as to consider sending my ties to some conference in Africa. Maybe that'll confuse them enough that it'll stay there and actually do the work of the tithe. But at the same time, we're not building up our mission field where we're at with those ties. So it, it has a number of questions, but if we were tied directly to the GC, we could tie directly to the GC and I'm not sure what we could set up, for example, for the support of our uh, Bible teachers in that kind of an organization here locally and so forth. We might have to do that um, on top of time. Uh, I've double tithe for a while when we were putting an addition on our church. And if it would make a difference, if people are committed enough, uh, many of us could probably double tithe send one tithe to the conference so that that gets used the way God intends it. And then the second tenth that we give could support our local work uh, locally. Part of the problem, at least for me, not I, I mean, we need to have some young people that are excited and interested in supporting the truth. I'm getting too old to do too much. I'm, I'm so uh, tired by the end of the day every day because i refuse to slow down but but nevertheless this I, you know i mean it just happens and you have no control over it so we need to get some young people on board i would sure be happy to support them in every way i could it's uh, keith ferris uh, rocky mountain conference i'm not in favor of forming a separate organization um certainly not an organization to which we would uh, pay tithe um Circumstances might get worse in the future to the point where the general conference might have to set up a way for members that uh, are uncomfortable with what's going on over them to legitimately uh, be part of the world church and submit tithes. But I don't see that time as coming yet. Um, if you're interested in advancing the three angels' messages, I think we have a lot of organizations that are already in place, whether they be amazing facts or um, uh, you know, other good uh, ministries, um, but I wouldn't advise sending your tithe money there. Uh, that's that's my viewpoint. Okay, thank you. Hi, yeah, Jonathan Vi. I, I was a delegate, and also I'm in the Rocky Mountain Conference. Um, this entire situation has been very distressing to me, and I, I think I can say that there's a, a quite a few people who maybe are not uh, very definite on the issue of women's ordination or against it, but they are very concerned about the church order. 
And so I would like to um, suggest that maybe a good approach would be to fight the legality of what was voted, first of all. I think that's the first order thing that needs to be done. But um, secondly, as far as tithe and financial support, I do not feel good about supporting Rocky Mountain Conference right now based on what's happened. And I looked around at the options to me and I didn't see a lot of good ones. The only, the only option that seems to make sense that would not be considered being divisive is to move my family to the Southern Union, which I understand has voted to uphold the GC's uh, vote, the World Church's vote. And so that's a faithful union. And uh, since my house burned down in the Marshall Fire, it, it seems like a, a plausible option, but it's not an option for many people that are still here. So um, I did suggest, I did talk to someone a couple weeks ago who is not a GC vice president, but they are in contact with people who are. And I talked about this quandary. And I, I floated the idea, could the GC declare a mission that covers all of North America? And any uh, members in wayward conferences that are not um, in accordance with the world church, could we then organize churches and um, you know, send our financial support through those channels? And the person I talked to uh, didn't think that was a good idea. He thought that that would be, um, basically it would be splitting the church, which people don't want to do. So, Anyway, that's where we're at. I don't know what the right solution is. I'm praying about it. Um, I, I don't know that it would work for us to support our own organization independent of the blessing of the GC. I think that that could cause a lot of problems, um, but I'm not sure what to do. Thanks. All right, thank you. Uh, next one is Jim and Teresa. A few different comments. I agree with what was mentioned earlier that unfortunately, where things, where things are going is probably consistent with the progression in the in the world and that LGBTQ will be presenting itself stronger within the Adventist church. Um, discussing tithe, um, Keith mentioned, you know, people that want to support organizations like Amazing Facts and other places, they will like other conferences, if you call it tithe, they will send it directly back to the church and the conference. Amazing facts is that those organizations will not keep anything that's labeled tithe. I had thrown out to a friend, you know, that we have never been opposed to women preaching, but we are opposed to rebellion. And whereas I want to support our church, I find it hard to support a conference or a union that does not respect the authority and the and the uh, structure of our church in defying world church policy. Um, I I ask, well, if we give our church, if we give our tithe to a, a license, you know, an official church treasurer that can distribute, um, a, a, you know, authoritative um, tax deduction credit to that. Are they able to put that tithe into a escrow fund with the understanding that it will be distributed to the conference and union when that union brings its policies in line with the world church Money. and just withhold it in a escrow account until the conference does bring their policies inconsistent with the world church. I'm not sure they would do that. The conference might say, we have the right to defy any world church policy that we see fit to, but you are required to obey all of our policies and you must you know, submit tithe directly. You can't disobey us, but we can defy the world church. So those you know, are my thoughts and concerns. I think it is gonna get worse because we're gonna see separation. I think the idea from Jonathan to have a, a separate mission Yes, it is a bit of a separation. It's causing a separation, but there is a big separation taking place right now. I don't think it can be avoided. And I think that is a milder separation than splitting into two different churches. To have a mission within the North America is not splitting into two separate churches, but respecting 
the desire to support the world church policies and not rogue unions that defy church policy. So I guess I would support a mission like that. I wouldn't mind asking my church treasurer to hold my tithe in an escrow account until the conference and union brings their policies in, in line. I don't know if that's legal or how it would be handled. I wouldn't mind a church mission or an organization to hold my tithe in escrow before they send it back to the conference. So if I can send my tithe to some other conference and they are obligated to return it to the uh, Mid-American Union, they could hold it in escrow until the Mid-American Union brings their policies back into consistence with the World Church. I don't know if there's a conference union or mission that would agree to hold it in escrow like that. So that would be my questions. I'm gonna to come to Paul next, but um, I think you really have two choices at the present. Maybe I'm wrong. Basically, you can go ahead and um, submit to the, your member. I'm talking about members to Rocky Mountain Conference. You can submit to the Rocky Mountain Conference decision. That means you agree with your, your sustaining the voted decision. And that would mean then that you really are sustaining the rebellion against the world church. That's one course of action you could take. The other course of action, logically, would be to separate yourself from the rebellion by, by somehow withdrawing from uh, Rocky Mountain Conference um, in order to support the truth in the World Church decision. Uh, but presently, there's no option evident for people who want to do that. Now, the mission idea uh, or starting a different organization there that would attach to the GC, those are ways it would sort of fit with that. But um, anyway, I think you're either kind of stuck now because the constituency voted. You're really kind of stuck with either submitting to and becoming part of the rebellion or finding some other solution where you're not supporting and becoming part of the rebellion. So uh, maybe I'm too stark, but I think those are your two options. Now, Paul, you're waiting patiently. Go ahead, Paul. Um, yeah, I just want to read uh, one quote. This is from Pastoral Ministry, page 260, paragraph 2. It says, if the conference business is not managed according to the order of the Lord, that is the sin of the erring ones. The Lord will not hold you responsible for it if you do what you can to correct the evil. But do not commit sin yourselves by withholding from God his own property. Um, I, personally, I'm, I am conflicted with the whole tithing issue, but I know personally in our own church, it's hard enough getting funds from people as it is, you know, that will tithe faithfully and, and even give offerings. Um, so I'm not sure withholding tithe is necessarily the best option at this point, and I'm not sure it's really going to accomplish much. Um, I know on your tithe envelopes, at least, you can try to focus your tithe more towards your local church budget versus it going to any, you know, conference or uh, uh, union-specific um offerings um, like we usually have every other week we'll have specific offerings that are for conference or union um, things um, so I mean I think withholding our tithe is not necessarily the best option at this point and uh, you know for a lot of us moving to another conference or trying to do something like that's really not a viable option um, you know Obviously, like you said, this this conference now is as much a mission field as any place, and I think we need to continue to focus our efforts here in educating our people on what's going on. The, that's the biggest thing I've seen through the last couple of years with COVID and everything going on and this whole women's ordination thing is, and, and, and this is coming from personal experience, a lack of knowing how the church works you know I'd, I'd never read the church manual before and over the last few years we've had issues in our church pop up that has forced me to actually read what the church manual says how is the church supposed to be run and every page i read it was like man i had i had no clue every, everything i thought i should have done was the opposite of what the church manual you know said so we need to educate our people in how the church is run and on topics like this so we can avoid 
as much as possible these issues. But we know the church, as we continue down this path of history, is only going to get worse and worse, and we're going to see more and more issues. Obviously, there may be some things that we can do as far as creating missions and whatnot in the future. Is that maybe the direction we need to go just yet? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure, but um, that's just that's just my opinion. It is a very vexing challenge. Uh, John and Allie, um, you're next. Um, by the way, um, are you in which which conference, if you m don't mind saying so? Are you in the Mid-American oh, no, Union or the Rocky Mountain? Uh, no, I'm, whoa, dear. I tried to put on my camera and I've done something weird here. I'm from the um, Oregon Conference, North Pacific Union, and we have a lot of the same things going on here. And I really agreed with a lot of the Paul said. I'm a fourth generation Adventist, have been very, very active in my church, but frankly, very discouraged right now. And I guess one of the things that I was looking at was the last, or thinking about was the last general conference session when they kept um, Pastor Diop in the ecumenical religious liberty position. And what we've been seeing with our church getting involved with Catholicism. And I'm just wondering how much longer all of this is going to really matter. We do need to do all that we can um, in our local areas, but it just seems to me that education is really a key to letting people understand, encouraging those that we can to um, be faithful. And I was thinking of WACUS. I don't know how many people know about that, but that's one education program that is out there. And then Pastor Vine has said that we all need to be considering the possibility that in the next year or two, we're going to need to go to home churches. And I don't like that. I, you know, I'm a conference person. That's the way I was raised. Um, I've supported it all my life, but right now, I don't see a way, the way they have the, the program set up for elections, the way they have it set up for the pressure on pastors um, and on even individual church leaders. I don't know, every, every church is gonna be a little different, but I don't know that we're going to be able to make a major change in the way our conferences are run. Okay, thank you, Allie. Um, heartfelt, appreciate that. And we're, we're focusing now kind of on what could be done, which is probably the most vexing part of this trouble, since everything that's been could be done so far hasn't been done, if it could be done. It, it just seems to me it, it's a it's a ongoing problem that gets worse and worse. So, for example, in our conference, after the vote was taken on whether to ordain women or not, one of the first actions of the president of the conference was to request uh, authority from the delegates to deal with anybody, any workers in the conference who were openly divisive on this issue, which is almost understandable. It didn't get decided then because it ended up getting moved um, to the executive committee to deal with it. And I think they've probably dealt with it to some extent already. I saw something in the chat room that said that something was happening there, but I don't know what has happened. But the point I'm trying to make is that ongoing, these conference leaders are not going to bring in any pastors who are openly against women's ordination. I almost guarantee it. And that's one of my biggest problems with continuing to send tithe to this conference. I believe that the purpose of a tithe, according to Ellen White, is to support the gospel ministers, not just the gospel in general. That's the purpose of the tithe, and that's what I want my tithe to go to. But I also don't want to go, I don't want my tithe to go to ministers who are not preaching truth. So it just becomes a real issue of exactly how we do. The best I've heard today is your idea of a separate mission. Well, remain all Seventh-day Adventists. That money goes to the GC. Presumably they would apportion that tithe to ministers in this mission field that would do God's work and we could happily and, and joyously support. Uh, the other possibility is, is the issue of, of uh, setting up some kind of an entity where we could hold tithes. I can tell you from experience in this conference, we had a church, for example, that started up years ago called Grace Place in Berthoud, Colorado. And they were a celebration church. They started going all different directions. And a lot of conference people were upset about it and wanted the conference to deal with it. They wouldn't. 
But the time finally came when they started keeping the tithes themselves and not sending it on to the conference. They were paying their own minister and using the tithe as they pleased and birth it. Within two months, the problem was dealt with. In other words, if there is a sufficient amount of tithe that the conference knows is sitting out there that is not being sent on to them, something will happen. Thank you. Let's go to Steve, and then we'll go to Joshua V. Himes. I, I wonder what the advantages versus the disadvantages, Larry, to starting up a missionary uh, society or whatever. Um, on one side, I see that uh, the powers that be, they don't play softball. I think we're kind of figuring that out by now. And it probably, in my mind, would lead to litigation. Nobody needs that. Um, why not uh, work within the system? Form. I, I'm just throwing something out. You could name it something differently, but uh, just like a, a, a Bible club or whatever within churches and have meetings that occur. You know, everybody attends uh, church on Sabbath morning and so forth, but you have other meetings during the week. I mean, there's six other days. <laughs> so... Yeah do a lot of what you're talking about without stirring up a lot of uh, a flack. Uh, you know, Jesus didn't go to the, he didn't get in the Pharisees faces when he didn't need to. And, and uh, it was the Pharisees that went out to John the Baptist. He didn't go to them. And I just think that, uh, you know, the Lord is going to separate the wheat from the chaff. We know about the shaking that's going to come and those that uh, don't have their hearts surrendered to him will uh, will flee. And I, th I think we can accomplish what you're trying to do without um, creating a lot of waves, so to speak. You know, there's two reasons why things haven't been fixed. Either the machinery doesn't work. You know, the, the, the disciplinary process and all that, it's all written out, but it doesn't work. Or you have uh, people who are in leadership who are unwilling. They're unwilling to act, or it's a combination of those things. Um, if if we had people who were willing to act and the machinery worked, this would already, we would not never be having this meeting. It would have been solved. So I don't know what the answer for sure is, but... Um, it's a dilemma, and as time goes on, you know, Nebuchadnezzar didn't want the time to change, the times and the seasons. He was afraid that if it did, that the wise men would get away with what they wanted to get away with in Babylon, and uh, seven years now has gone by since 2015, so um, maybe Nebuchadnezzar had some pretty good theology going on there. But anyway, let me go to Joshua V. Himes. So I just wanted to make two comments. One, you know, I'm not a lawyer. I don't know very much about nonprofit law specifically, but it is my understanding that when I give money to the church, I'm giving to a nonprofit. And when you specify a nonprofit donation goes to a certain activity of the nonprofit, then the nonprofit has to reserve those funds to that specific purpose. So I wonder if it would be possible when writing the tithe check to just put in the memo saying this is tithe to be used to pay, you know, pastors and ministers in organizations that are in substantial compliance with the ordination practices as designated by the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists in World Session. Um, we'd likely need a lawyer to, to purse that out, but I think that if there's a tithe check that's cashed with that caveat, the caveat actually stays with that money and it could not be sent back to a organization that is not in harmony with the, you know, whatever you write on the tithe check. Um, the other thought is, you know, the, it seems like that there was a little bit of hope at GC session this year that there may be some things changing at, at annual council this year, and that may be something to see as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, Paul, you're next. I just kind of had a thought come across my head. I, you know, I know we're kind of all struggling with what to do with our ties, but we remember that we also have 
offerings. You know, we, we, we can give our offerings to specific places, including, you know, other ministries, be it Amazing Facts. Um, we started a ministry ourselves recently, um, you know, so you can give money to other places that you know are, uh, you know, pushing this, the, the, the idea that you believe in. Um, so maybe tithes we're still kind of figure out to do with, but you can still support other ministries that um, are upholding the general conferences, uh, teachings and ideas as far as the ordination of women. Um, so, I mean, we, we, we got to remember that too. Yeah. Thank you. This is the Oregon Conference. I'm in fact from then. And um, we were missionaries in Korea for a period of time when we came back to America. Down at Loma Linda, we ended up down there sending money to Glendale, Southeast California. And we learned that um, they had money for the preachers and so forth and didn't need it. And at that time, Back in the 70s, money was sent to the general conference, and we called it tithe exchange, and it was sent back to be used as non-tithe. And the GC sent it overseas to certain ministries that needed tithe. And so I studied into tithe usage, and I find that the administration changes the use of the tithe as they feel need. They will pay a certain percentage to the Adventist teachers in our schools and a variety of different uses. And they will have resorts to have a week for the ministers to go have prayer conference on the Oregon coast and so forth. And they call, how do they pay tithe and where do they spend tithe money? So if you study into it, you end up saying, hey, we're not going to heaven as a group. We're going as individuals. And you're going to have to decide how you live your life, use your money, and work with the Lord and represent him faithfully. So a few years back, we decided that if we came back, how do we support the ministry? We go to Cuba, and we supported over up to 150 Bible workers from different churches for a year because their salary is very low. So therefore, we've had the conference choose people in Cuba to give Bible studies. And therefore, some of them were ministers' wives, and they had 50 to 60 Bible studies on a list which they gave us that they were given Bible studies to. And we paid them for a year. And they wanted us to come visit them because they want to know who was supporting them. So we went to Cuba. But we found out that Mark Finley came over a year later or so and baptized over 100 people, a 1,000 people. And so we say, this is the proper use of the tithe that the General Conference picked out Bible workers. And when you study, what's the tithe supposed to be used for? And at present, we find that we have a minister trained with an MD, MDiv, and um, he is baptizing people and translating the Bible, Book of John, and he is translating Desire of Ages in a communist country, which will not allow us to print. The communists have to do the printing. He was raised a communist, and now he's an Adventist minister, but we can support what? Printing Desire of Ages, the Bible, is this proper use of the tithe? So as we can send money individually to specific projects, I don't feel guilty when the Lord, I don't feel is going to keep me out of heaven because I supported translating Desire of Ages and the Bible and supporting people who need to learn the gospel, period. Uh, Ron Myers, did you have your hand up or not? I didn't want to miss you if you did. Yeah, and we have to do with Susan and tell RMC and then Steve. Thank and you. We're going to start moving or wind down the call here because we don't want to wear everybody out. But go ahead, Ron. Okay. Yes, I just wanted to uh, point out the fact that we are an ASI member, 
and uh, while we're not a member of the local conference there, we do have a, a major radio broadcasting station in Denver. And when it comes to education of members and people in general, uh, we want to be a part of this. And when we heard that uh, prominent speakers such as Stephen Bohr were no longer invited to this conference, uh, we continue to broadcast his, his sermons. In fact, we're going to do more of it. People like Doug Batchelor and Walter Veith. Uh, we're here to support whatever you gentlemen decide. Uh, I'm not sure what the answer is, but it, it pains my heart to see the church being broken apart over this and, of course, the issue which is following, and that's the LGBTQ issue. And uh, we're here to maintain a faithfulness to uh, general conference decisions and to be of support in every way possible. So don't forget, you do have a local major radio voice available. And whenever you want to make use of this, and I hope you will make use of this opportunity to speak to our members, get the word out that we're here, and let's do what we can together to help educate our members to understand it. As someone said earlier, it's not just the conference leaders, it's the members who are unaware of the biblical teaching in this matter. Thank you, that's all I have to say. Thank you, thank you. By the way, I appreciate one thing you said, well, I appreciate many things you said, but in particular, you should all know, every one of you should know, uh, a minister who is an ordained minister, uh, who is not under any kind of discipline, your conference, no conference has any any authority to tell you you can't bring that that pastor in that preacher in you that's something that should be ignored uh with a capital i uh they, they don't have that authority your your local church has the authority uh to bring in a credentialed worker like that so anyway my hat's off to those who aren't uh aren't, aren't willing to be slapped around indefinitely by uh, the people that just want to stop that so anyway uh i don't i want to take up your time at your time susan go ahead I'd like to go back to something you brought up earlier. The general conference does not know who we are or how many there are who are saying no to this. And there needs to be some method of letting them know, some kind of organized method that people can join in, in some manner to let the general conference know this is unacceptable, that we expect something to be done, and that uh, we are uh, supporting the general conference. So I don't know what would be the best way to do this, but I think it needs to be seriously considered. Okay, thank you. Yes, and that's why we're trying to have everybody put your name, your contact info, your phone number, your email into the uh, chat window, and then you have the option for the signal group um, to join that. And then we're trying to get ways that you guys can connect with each other and figure out, you know, pray together, figure out what you steps you might take or not take there might be some steps you're very definite you don't want to take. But um, apart from some kind of uh, clarification, just like you're saying, Susan, I don't think that they'll know. Um, okay, I see uh, tell RMC. Is there something you want to tell RMC? Uh, along the lines of what Susan was saying, it sounds like a, a petition of some order with names would be a way to present something like that to the GC. But uh, as far as the issue, it, or uh, discussing the whole uh, what should be done. I think, well, I don't know, just throwing out an idea that the local church, I mean, authority really rests locally. And so uh, one thing I think, uh, we're very blessed at our church to have a faithful conservative pastor. And if the conference ever tried to take him away, that'd be a big problem. And I think one thing we might need to do is hold our local pastors accountable for those that support uh, the, the RMC's current decision. Uh, we mentioned that a conference is concerned very much with tithe dollars, and I believe that you know very much to be true. Another thing they seem to be very concerned with is membership. And I think if you had chur churches that all of a sudden lost a lot of their faithful members to other churches that were shepherded by faithful ministers, that might also send um, a message. And those pastors would be on the hot seat for losing a lot of members. The, the unfaithful pastors that support women's ordination is what I'm talking about. So I don't know, one idea maybe would be to 
uh, in order to hold our local pastors accountable is to have uh, some sort of statement that um, is an affirmation of the G general conference's decision on the matter and have them sign it if they are in agreement with it, that they will uphold the GC position regarding women's ordination. And maybe that would be an appropriate thing for the elders of the church too. And that way it would be very clear where the pastor stands on this. And then the membership of that church, the lay people can base their church membership on that. And they can move to a, to a jurisdiction where there are faithful elders and pastors. Um, that might have some effect in sending a message to our, our conference. That's just an idea. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, let me tell you a very short story. In Upper Columbia Conference, uh, we had the president uh, urgently agitating that we're going to ordain women and moving in that direction. He said he'd go by the GC session decision. When the GC session came that night, he got on the Facebook uh, telling how he didn't like the decision. And uh, anyway, he kept pushing and pushing. So anyway, at some point, the Upper Columbia, this was Upper Columbia Conference. This is Northeastern Washington, Idaho, and Oregon. Um, the Upper Columbia Conference Executive Committee suddenly decided they were going to uh, change the commission credential so that the commission minister credential had all the authority of the ordained minister. The uh, Well, it turns out that some layperson came up and looked at the constitution of the Upper Columbia Conference and found out that I think it was 15%. If 15% of the church boards called for a special constituency meeting, that uh, they would, the conference would be obligated to hold a special constituency meeting. And suddenly one of the churches in Idaho voted for it. And anyway, before long, there was 15 or 16 churches had voted for it. Uh, the threshold was somewhere around 16 to, to 18 churches. Um, and let me just tell you that suddenly uh, the conference executive committee revoked uh, its, its plan on the credential and uh, because they wanted to avoid the special constituency session. Uh, of course, since that time, some of the ministers who, some of us that were opposed to women's ordination and in favor in supporting the World Church have sort of been encouraged to leave. And now I'm working in a different conference. But, uh, but anyway, that's one thing you could do is to, your, your individual churches could, um, this wouldn't, it's not a solution. A petition is not a solution. When this is, you're in a war. This is absolutely a war to change the church. Um, these guys are going straight ahead with or without you and without you. Uh, so don't 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 misunderstand your situation. This is truly military. What's going on? Uh, your churches could vote statements repudiating the action of the uh, Rocky Mountain constituency uh, and on your local church level saying we uh, we completely oppose this. But that would be a stopgap. That would just be, it would be kind of give you a, an encouraging feeling, but it's not going to change the fact that um, your conference is now ready, probably has some people in a pipeline to submit names of uh, persons to be ordained by the, uh, in, in uh, connection with the Mid-America Union, which will again bring the same problem back. Anyway, I'm. Uh, let me go speak briefly, and we're going to move toward the end of this call. But go ahead, sure. Steve. Just a comment on the uh, quote regarding the misuse of funds and withholding tithes and so forth. There, in my opinion, there's a vast difference between misusing funds and rebellion. <laughs> so that's one factor. And as far as people using their, uh, submitting their tithe, uh, I would refer them to do a little research on the uh, work with uh, the black community back in Ellen White's day with Willie White and what was it, the Morning Star uh, paddle boat and s steamer and so forth. Uh, so she just, if, if I recall, somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but she just said, you know, don't make an issue about it, just do what you need to do. So again, uh, my thought is stay under the radar and do God's work. And, and like uh, one of you mentioned, I think we have professional people who have a strong agenda, who are very determined, and they're just going to run over you like a steamroller unless you, unless there's a way you resist. So, um, 
and and uh, support the World Church decision. Is there any other thoughts about how you might all connect or whether you think you need to connect again? Because now at least here's something we didn't really have in 2015 is uh, we've got this opportunity to connect in a setting like this Zoom meeting. So this is actually uh, potentially a very remarkable way of being connected with each other and keep from getting run over by the steamroller. So you keep on living and giving the third angel's message in your churches. Go ahead. Larry, this is the beginning. So with that in mind, uh, maybe another meeting down the road like this would, or maybe a few would be good. We don't need to make, come up with all the solutions in one, one get go. So that's my uh, thought. Well, I'm, I'm kind of trying to give you a voice. This is like journalism within the church. I'm giving you a voice by connecting you like this. But I, since I'm outside of Rocky Mountain, I'm trying kind of not to be an organizer for you guys. I'm not trying to be an inciter or a shouter. I'm I'm just trying to give you guys a voice because I, I don't think your conference newsletter, your your union newspaper probably is going to want to hear from you because of your positions. And we'll try to connect you all with each other and uh, let you get together. As far as my part in this, I don't know if there will be a future part or not, but I encourage you to get together and um, and maybe we would do another call like this, uh, depending on what what you all want to do or come up with. But uh, let me just sign off kind of by saying, you know, to those of you who might be watching this video later on uh, from the World Church, I want to say this to you. Uh, here I'm calling coming to you from North America, North American Division. And I want to say to you that um, I personally believe and I've pastored in many conferences and worked all these years and been a member of these years. Most of the world, most of the members in North America, I believe, support the general conference, support the three decisions of the general conference not to ordain women, either directly or indirectly did those three decisions. Uh, we are appalled that such a high percentage of our unions and conferences are out of synchronization with the World Church and are showing a uh, rebellious spirit and a disrespectful spirit toward the rest of you in the World Church. Um, please pray for us. Um, it seems as though after all this time that the mechanisms or the leadership, however it is, has not fixed this. And in fact, it seems like there's a, a tidal wave of rebellion that is increasing now so that in many places, in many unions and conferences in our area, we seem to have women's ordination running rampant. I don't know what the answer is. I'm just a pastor right now. I'm just speaking to you as a lay person, but uh, do pray for us. Um, it may be that we're at a spot where some of the leadership in our conferences needs to be put on a hot air balloon and you need to cut the rope. And um, I, I, I really don't know, but... Uh, Anyways, pray for your leaders and pray that God will prevail and pray that, uh, let's pray, but more than prayer, I think you guys need to organize and act some which way so that, so that, you know, the world, when the Seventh-day Adventist Church began, there was congregations scattered here and there, and they weren't in any organization, but they managed to get together. They worked out the Sister Betsy, you know, systematic benevolence, tithing, and all that eventually, and they were able to organize a remarkable thing. You don't need to reinvent the wheel, you just need to keep the wheel rolling that's already rolling. Uh, the trouble is, I'm talking about the wheel of truth, not the wheel of women's ordination. That wheel, I think, needs to stop. And I wanna thank each person who contributed to this phone, uh, to this discussion. And again, we're not here gathering to try to uh, bump tithes someplace or another or form an alien organization or something, but we've been just having a heart to heart very open-minded talk. I think because to this point, it seems as though nothing's nothing effectual has been done. So those of you that watch this later, uh, we want to work together, but if something isn't done effectually, then obviously we're doing something wrong. We may need to think, think strain, more strangely than we've ever thought. Anyway, may God bless this church and help us to stay on, on Jesus' agenda, living and giving the third angel's message. And may those that are in rebellion, and I mean the unfaithful leaders in Mid-America Union and the unfaithful leaders in the Rocky Mountain Conference and unfaithful leadership in other unions and conferences. And I'm, I don't mind calling you out, sorry. 
may 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 you um if you're determined to go against the world church and do your own separate thing please please leave and go start a new organization and do something different i think what's on your mind if you're in rebellion though is you're going to take over this organization and have your own way and my prayer is that god's god's own people will prevent you from doing it so find to see if the gift of repentance doesn't come to you anyway that's an address to those who are trying to uh, bring in new light which is not new light at all for the rest of us may god bless you all thank you for participating in this call i'll probably get, do a little editing of the slow spots and throw it out maybe tomorrow morning onto the internet probably a new article on fulcrum seven and uh Again, I hope you'll all get together, and God bless you all. I'm glad I'm not in your conference, but apparently this is coming very quickly to virtually every conference, so um, I do not feel safe, but God is on his throne. Thank you, each one. Uh, we should pray. Um, ben, uh, ben Van Fossen, if you're still with us here, I don't see you on the screen here but um yep i am here would you would you have a word of prayer for us absolutely let's bow our heads heavenly father we just thank you so much that you are in control you warned us uh, that there would be times uh, where our church looks like it's going to fail you've warned us to to endure to be patient um, to be bold and zealous and we want to do that but we want to do that with hearts of love and compassion it can only come from Jesus. May we be light shining, reflecting little mirrors and moons wherever we're at, reflecting your great light in our communities. And give us the strength we need that we can be, that we can stand firm in truth and have a love for truth and continue the gospel commission. Thank you so much for this opportunity to be able to pray and speak with each other. And I just pray that you would continue to bring us into one accord. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for your, your frankness and your boldness. God bless you all. If I may, if it would be appropriate, can I put a little plug in now for our ministry in case anybody's interested in checking it out? <laughs> so go ahead. So, we have uh, so myself, Ben Van Fossen, and my wife, a couple of years ago, started a, a ministry called Adventist Revival Ministries, um, something we felt necessary as we saw everything happening during COVID and the things going on within our church and, and things like this that's happening in our conference. Um, so I put our information in the, uh, uh, the chat um, for our ministry if anybody is interested in checking out. We appreciate any support in uh, helping us to spread the the gospel truth and, and, you know, educate people.